our two o'clock session. Um, just a reminder that uh, put your phones on vibrate. Uh, we have exits in the case of emergency. Um, look for someone with a radio or a blue volunteer shirt. Um, stay hydrated. It's hot today, and um, you know, have fun. Right now, I'd like to introduce Davide Semenzen, uh, and he's going to be talking about why building digital libraries matters. Thank you, Davide. Oh wow, the lights are bright. Hey, everybody. Thank you. All right. Uh, of course. <laughs> One sec. Oh, OK, whatever. I'll freestyle this. All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Davide. I am a software engineer by trade. I studied computer science, like many of you, I guess. Um, I spent most of my career working in distributed systems. I currently work at AWS, but I spent um, a good chunk um, of about five years working at the, um, at the Internet Archive. Um, and there, I worked building the platform to digitize books at scale. And it's work that I think about a lot, and I think it's, uh, um, it's very meaningful to me. And so um, while I remain um, associated with the Archive, I also just always really liked books, and I always really cared about libraries and the humanities. And so I don't know if these are credentials enough, but you know we're all here. We'll try to make it fun. And I have a statue. The Internet Archive is a um, nonprofit organization, so they don't have stock options to give you. So after three years you stay there, they make a little statue of you. And that's mine, holding the This Is Fine dog. Anyway, so I'm here today to talk to you about building digital libraries. And OK, let's get real. Like, you saw the title of this talk, you're all here, and that means that in a sense you wanted to engage with this idea of a digital library. So it's a real question, I'm asking you, what, what's a library? What, what do you think a library is? I really want to hear it. Any, any takers? You can use a 3D printer in your library? That's awesome. Um, 3D printer? A website with all the books, that's really good. I like your notion of a, of a library. Go ahead. Go ahead. Exactly. It's a place where you can retrieve things that is well organized. Actually, that is as close to my definition as it gets. I think it's an accessible and organized collection of materials. I think accessible is more important than organized. Libraries, it's better if they are organized, but they really have to be accessible. Otherwise, they're just collections. And it's important that they are a collection of materials, not just of stuff. Otherwise, a landfill would be a library, right? Like, it, there has to be some inherent value in, uh, in whatever it is that, that, that we're collecting. Um, and so I, I want to try and answer this question of why do digital libraries matter? by going through uh, a couple of other questions. In a, in a way, asking why of anything is a little bit of a philosophical question, right? Which is just a fancy way of saying that you have to answer a whole bunch of other questions before you get there. And so we have a working notion of what is a, what is a library, and we're going to come back to this. Um, the next question would be, who builds libraries? And you know, you can think of your uh, classic library, like your library down the street, uh, that's a library. You can think of the library um, in, in maybe high school or university or your law firm or the Internet Archive. Uh, private libraries are libraries as well. And you know, people have been building libraries since the dawn of time, so the, the ecosystem is, is really robust. Uh, there are government and government-like entities building libraries. Um, almost every country has a national library. And, well, then there are companies. Companies companies have libraries, but aren't necessarily libraries. If you think of a certain search engine who spent um, a very significant amount of money building a very large digital collection of books, uh, they're not really a library, because they're not accessible. The collection exists, but it is, not, it, access, it is accessed on their own terms. Maybe a snippet at a time, maybe pay for play, maybe not at all. 
So um, I'm kind of on the verge about on, on that one, but we're going to put it in there. And then there is you. There's like me, you. We have like a cell phone. Your cell phone is a digital library. In, in this world, we're all engaging in, in, in the creation of, of digital libraries. So this, this matters for a variety of reasons. And not the least of it is that you're taking part in it, whether you like it or not. So of all of the people who are, are engaging willingly or unwillingly in uh, the uh, construction of digital libraries, I think the Internet Archive um, is, is maybe one of, one of the, the, the most important or certainly notable examples. And if you do not know what the Internet Archive is, um, the top of the line uh, description is that it is a digital library that has existed for about 26 years, I think it was 1996, right? May 10th, 1996. Um, and it is known for uh, this one um, pretty amazing piece of software called the Wayback Machine, where you can go back in time and see what websites looked like before they inevitably change or disappear. Uh, and it is headquartered in this beautiful building in San Francisco. It used to be a Christ Scientist church, and I kid you not, the reason we bought it is because it looked like our logo. This is a true story. Um, anyway, I, it, it, the, a lot of things work that way. Um, so I, I don't want to dwell too long on uh, uh, what the archive is, because there is like somebody else who can do it a lot better, and that, oops, and that is archive.org. So just visit the website. All the stuff is in there, whole hundred petabytes of it. Um, really, um, I want to move on to what, what I think uh, uh, is maybe like the, the closest part to my heart, which is really the how, because I'm an engineer and I spent many years of my life building uh, the tool to build the library. So the question of how do you build a library with purpose at a certain scale, well, I can answer that. And it's pipeline. It's not very surprising. So um, I'm going to talk about this only a little bit. Um, I'm going to leave time at the end for questions so I can maximize my chances of saying something that is of interest to you guys. Um, but at a high level, um, there are just two boxes. There is a purple box. That's stuff that happens um, on the scanner in the world. There are hundreds of the scanners scattered all over the world. Uh, and the blue stuff is what happens inside um, our, um, call it cloud. So the way this works is that we start with a scanner. We um, receive a book, and then we have to somehow transform it into a digital artifact, well, the first step is to take pictures of it. And so we have devised these, these, these devices. These are all built by us, all developed by us, um, some of them um, in, like, in different eras, uh, and they all cater to different use cases. Uh, you have this full frame scribe. Um, it's a very large kind of contraption. Um, it's got a... Um, um, a very big cradle, so you use this for very large books that have maybe uh, difficult spines, like dictionaries and stuff like that. Um, uh, it's also very good for um, for digitizing very delicate um, delicate objects. We have a mandate of doing non-destructive scanning, which makes things a little more complicated than if you could just like rip the spine off and turn this into a um, just a page-turning exercise. Um, there aren't so many of these full frame scribes. They're very expensive. They're, uh, they're custom built. They're bulky. Um, our real blockbuster is the tabletop scribe. We built a lot of these. And all of these are built off of consumer hardware, consumer cameras. Um, they're easy to manufacture. They're easy to transport. Um, and they provide uh, pretty high quality. Uh, and then, so we use these for really like the mass digitization stuff. Um, and then there is like the fold out scribe, which is like this table with a it's a glorified table with a camera, really. Uh, but the camera is very precisely positioned, and it's very, very high quality. Um, and so you use this for maps, atlases, uh, things of that sort, like re really large format. Anyway, so uh, I put the slide in here. It's really not that important, but this is the software that I spent five years developing, so I just figured like it should be in the presentation. Uh, this is just the software that we use, right? We run on the scanners. And what it really does is, um, it collates a bunch of different functions together. It's kind of like a Swiss Army knife of, of book scanning. Um, it can mm, process metadata, load data, um, try to figure out if there are errors in the, um, in the way the book was scanned before we send it. Um, and then ultimately it takes care of uploading to, to the archive. And I'm gonna come back to these themes later because uh, none of that is actually simple. Anyway, 
After we um, have successfully uploaded all of the data in the archive, a bunch of stuff starts happening. That's kind of cool. So first, we pre-process all of this stuff. So we deskew it, we auto-crop it, we make sure that we have all of the derivative formats for images so that we can uh, we can move to the next step, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, and then generally, like we, we modify the structural metadata so that um, we have a, an easy to modify book. And uh, the, the reason that matters is because we have um, a sort of human in the loop stage called republishing. And that is when a human actually revises what the automation has done and makes sure that the book is good and that everything has been like worked out properly. Uh, and uh, it uses like a, another piece of homegrown software like this. Um, and sometimes, you know, at this stage we find errors and there is this like oof, really painful rigmarole that we need to go through to send back the book to the original scanner where it was originated, fix it, it's very expensive, very complicated, it's, bo it's borderline magic, uh, so, so, uh, <laughs> so weird it is. But anyway, uh, provided that the, the human says, okay, everything looks good, um, it, the book is checked in, and we move into a post-processing phase where um, we actually apply all of those crops and those disqueues and all of those transformations, um, and we do a bunch of other um, metadata um, extraction on, on the images and um, color correction, all of this sort of stuff. Uh, and then the output of this stage is um, a set of files plus a description of the structure of the book plus the metadata. And then from here, we derive all of the other formats that we, uh, we distribute, PDF, EPUB, text, we OCR it. I'm gonna talk about OCR later. Anyway, and so this is how you end with a digital book in short. If you guys wanna know like more details, we can talk about this at, at the end. So this kind of like at a high level, what the building blocks are. So what's kind of interesting about uh, this whole thing is uh, what was hard about it. And I entirely uh, arbitrarily divided the challenges that we had into uh, whether they pertain to the bits or whether they pertain to the atoms. So in terms of the bits, what I call the logical challenges, um, if, you, if any of you has worked for any length of time on distributed systems, this is not gonna come as a big surprise, but um, in a highly uh, process-oriented environment, catching and correcting errors as soon as possible is, is of critical importance, because um, from the moment an error is made and the page is turned, a clock starts ticking, and with every passing second, correcting that error becomes more expensive. Um, I talked about this rigmarole that we have to go through if we figure out, I don't know, two, three, four days later that a book that was scanned has a page uh, that was blurry or something. You know, you have to go figure out where that book is, figure out what the page is. It takes like a lot of time. Um, metadata curation also um, kind of a, kind of a thorny problem, mostly because. Um, Books are, um, and this is, a, this is a theme that will come back, uh, books are an expression of uh, human endeavors, and so they are very, very different from each other. They don't follow a schema, and computers really like schemas, and so sometimes it's really difficult to wrangle things that way, it's, um, and obviously you have to maintain large databases of, uh, um, of metadata, and Brewster hates databases. Anyway, um, maybe one of the biggest real challenges that we had, and by real, I mean stuff that uh, will ruin your day if it doesn't work, uh, was this problem of delivering um, industrial level process reliability over what it is fundamentally an unreliable backend. And so let me talk about this for a second. Um, there are very good reasons why the Internet Archive is quote unquote unreliable. I think that by my estimation, the Internet Archive is available 99.9% .9 of the year, which is a whole lot better than your average library, which is available hardly 50% of the time. Um, but for a digital native, 99.9 .9 is not so great. And so, I mean, I think if you tally, tally it at the end of the year, like the archive maybe was off, offline for an hour a year, but it's not continuous, it's, it's in blips. And if you're borrowing a book, that really doesn't matter that much. Sorry. 
But if you're trying to upload a book, it starts really, really disrupting your process. And as it turns out, you know, people who do uh, book scanning, uh, I mean, that's their job. And if people cannot do their job, they don't get paid. And if they don't get paid, they rightfully get very angry. And so we had to figure out a way to make sure that um, all of this system that we had devised kept running even when, you know, if the archive became a big hole in the ground for a while. Um, and again, if you've worked on distributed systems for any amount of time, uh, the kind of solutions that we came up with, they're not particularly uh, groundbreaking. It's like a lot of retries, a lot of back off, lots of caching everywhere. Um, but it, it, it would surprise me in retrospect how much time I, I spent trying to, um, you know, fix this kind of problems. Oh, um, another error, like something that really plagued me was people who put error messages in, inside the 200 OK. Don't do that. Anyway, uh, networking was also a big, big problem at times. Like if you're beaming like very large amounts of data over the open internet, at some point, some, but something is bound to go wrong. And sometimes, like something goes wrong in in uh, an AES that's completely outside of your control. So what do you do? Um, build a lot of caching, mostly. Uh, but again, like this is not particularly surprising. Uh, the stuff about atoms, like about the physical world was like what to me was the newest. Because as a software engineer, I am not really used. I think I, I have uh, some difficulty uh, dealing with the fact that the physical world has constraints. Um, and so, you know, if you're scanning any amount of books, you have to move them around, and they're bulky, and they're heavy, so you need like uh, pallets, and boxes, and forklifts, and containers, and like uh, it, it's, it's a whole thing, and you have to keep track of where everything is. You need to write software for that, obviously. Um, but you know, software kind of assumes like an idealized version of the world, and sometimes the world doesn't behave that way. So you know, book disposition was a problem at some point. Where is the stuff? Hard, hard problem. Um, I'm gonna come back to this, but the what I pompously call call the variability of the input space really means that books come in all sorts of really wacky formats, like a lot and. Very quickly, whatever assumption you make about a book, other than it exists, um, is going to be proven wrong at some point. It's crazy. Um, sometimes books are just broken. Um, pages are missing. Uh, there is ambiguity about how to deal with them. Sometimes they, they have pop-ups, fold-outs, all sorts of things um, that like, will make them um, not fit in our scanners. Um, and then I kind of put it here in the physical world, because like, mostly like stuff like fails physically, but uh, I, I mentioned that we built this stuff out of consumer hardware. And consumer hardware is consumer hardware. And sometimes it does not behave as advertised, or sometimes it doesn't behave at all. Um, so surprising how much time I had to spend debugging drivers. More than I cared, but um, so it is what it is. So now that I'm here and I have a pulpit, I actually want to address a little pet peeve of mine. So, a couple of years ago, maybe a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago, this video made the rounds on the internet. And here you see Eliza. She's awesome. She works as a book scanner at the San Francisco Scanning Center. She's one of our best scanners, one of the fastest. In fact, I used to uh, uh, to use her as a benchmark. Uh, she's an extremely uh, thorough and capable person, and she's really, really good at her job. So, this video made the rounds on Twitter. And if, you've not, if, you, uh, if you have not been on Twitter, what you need to know about Twitter is that Twitter is a place for nuance, where uh, everybody's very calm, and where everybody really takes their time thinking about what they're about to say. Um, and so when they saw this video, there is, like, there is a particular type of tech bro who will not be able to resist the temptation of optimizing a thing that he just learned the existence of. And it's invariably a dude. Um, and so it's the kind of person who will say, Oops. Why isn't this automated? Why do you have a person? And this really, really annoys me to no end. And so I just want to talk about this for a second, because the fact that we have a person in there, that is not a coincidence. It's not because a robot could, could do it better. So first of all, there are, if you were to put a robot where that person is, well, first of all, you have to account for this. I mentioned books, they come in all sorts of shapes. They are, they are big, they are heavy, they are bulky, some of them are fluffy, some of them are tiny, some of them have foldouts, some of them have pop-ups. Some of them, this happened to me, have tomato sauce in the cover. 
This is, obvious, this is a real thing. Um, it's good luck aut automating that. Like, give a computer, uh, give a robot the, uh, the task of turning that. And then, you know, texts are not just books. I, I talk about books a lot, but um, these are uh, palm leaves, inscripted palm leaves from Bali. This is still a very common type of, um, uh, of medium in Southeast Asia. And, you know, this is a very valuable text. We want to be able to digitize it. It's a text. We must be able to digitize it. We designed a system to digitize everything. There is no point in trying to automate this. Um, and actually, it's not just that there is no point trying to automate it. Um, a person does a lot more than what you see. A person does a lot more than turning pages. A person um, disambiguates ambiguity. Uh, a person can figure out when metadata is wrong. A person, uh, a person in this loop is a feature. It is not a bug. And if you actually want to run the numbers, I will not run the numbers here for you, but if you actually want to automate, say, okay, I don't care about the palm leaves, I don't care about like the, the tomato sauce, I only care about harmony books and like, you know, tiny little paperbacks. Uh, I just want to scan those. Well, uh, there's only two things you can do. Either you build your own um, uh, entire uh, automated solution, good luck building your robot, um, or you just get something off the shelf. And there are a few commercial vendors, and they, like, uh, if you actually run the numbers, what comes out is that the only metric that automation at this scale improves is cost. So, and since we're on the topic of pet peeves, people are sometimes, um, somehow, like, I've been asked about this all the time. I don't know why, but people are super fascinated with OCR. Um, and unfortunately, I, have, I never have anything to say because OCR to me was, uh, for who doesn't know, OCR is optical character recognition, is how you turn um, photos into like text files, uh, which is very important, but it is a, at least for uh, Latin alphabets, it is a solved problem. I never had to worry about OCR not working ever. So I'm sorry, I don't know anything about OCR, I'm the wrong person to ask. Anyway. So in terms of the, the takeaways um, from uh, you know, how do you build a digital library and then we can move on to why, um, I, think, I think what was hard was not what I thought was gonna be hard and what was actually hard I could never even conceptualize. Um, and so to me the lesson is like maybe a pretty common one but you know I guess it bears repeating. Don't try to be too smart, just like iterate quickly. You, you can never kind of like really figure it all out in your head before you actually try it. Um, anyway, so this is how you build um, a, a, a big library, how you build like a, a digital library at scale. But I want to circle back to this notion, like what we started is a library is, you know, a collection of, um, of items that, that have some value. And the fact that I have spent some time here talking about, you know, a, a big pipeline and all of these scanners that can digitize a lot of books, um, it makes, I don't want it to make it feel like this is a game of numbers. It certainly is not a game, and it is certainly not a game of numbers. Um, you will pardon my uh, romanticism here, but building a library is, 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 a, is an act of love. It's like there is something profoundly noble in wanting to preserve knowledge for knowledge's sake. And um, so I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about what it is, like what does this look like at the end of the day? Because we talked about the how, but what is it really? So a digital library is the ability for you at any minute of the day to load up this beautiful edition of the Hypnerotomachia polyphily. Um, this is a, a 1499 um, edition. Um, it's a book by um, Juan Francesco Colonna. Um, it was published by uh, Aldous Manutius in Venice. Uh, this, is, this, this publisher is, was a scholar, the guy who invented the semi semicolon and italics, 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 whatever. Um, and this is, a, this is a beautiful book, beautifully illustrated. Nobody really knows what it's about. Uh, it's kind of written in Latin and Greek and it's unclear. It like, talks about um, the, this like, uh, dreamy adventure where uh, Polyphilus tries to, um, to get to this, this woman. Anyway, it's full of like weird symbology. And you may ask, why would I want to know about this? Well, first of all, because it's awesome. Second of all, because maybe you've been reading a book called The Code of Four. 
great book. I highly recommend it. It's a book about a book. Um, you could expect that from me. Um, or what about this? Uh, uh, this is, I think, is 16. I have like I have it in my notes here. Uh, this is, I, oh yeah, uh, 1575 tra Tractatus on Hieroglyphics. Uh, the illustrations in here are awesome. This was uh, sponsored by the Medici family in Florence, like pretty much the whole Renaissance. Uh, what about? Oh, this is, uh, this is a collection of emblems and related poems, 166 of them. Um, was that like too classical for you? What about this? Do you know what this is? Um, about maybe 100 years before Pete Mondrian made these colors kind of mainstream, uh, Oliver Byrne, um, a mathematician, uh, published this, this book where he used the, the colors to elucidate uh, some concepts in uh, um, Euclid's elements. And this is just a beautiful, beautiful book. And you can access it anytime. Um, um, or if you're feeling a little gory, um, you have this book about death. It's a, it's a dance of death. There are like poems and prose and illustration about death, if you're feeling so inclined. Is that not morbid enough? What about the Old Testament? Um, this is pretty, pretty beautiful edition. Um, uh, there's a pretty beautiful edition of the Quran also. This is, I think, from uh, early 1900s. This was from, uh, I think, 14, 1599. Um, also, talk about the variability in books. This is left to right. Um, screwed a whole bunch of stuff up when I had to implement that. Uh, this is the Divine Comedy, as verbose as Dante wanted it to be. No, I'm kidding. This is, the, this is just the um, introduction. The Divine Comedy is, is written in, in rhyme. Uh, it looks pretty different. But this is like beautiful, uh, be beautiful text. Uh, or what about this tractatus on how to avoid premature burial? Apparently, in the mid-1800s, this was a concern. Um, and you know, why do digital libraries matter? Also because like, our memories are short. And sometimes we forget some of the weird ideas that we have or some of the bad ideas that we have. Introducing this tractatus on phrenology. Phrenology is the study of uh, the shape of the head to determine, to determine um, the characteristics and the character of a person. Something that hopefully we moved on from. Uh, but you can access it. Um, there's this beautiful, uh, oh yeah, talk about edgy. Uh, this is a beautiful, um, beautiful book. Uh, it's, uh, it's a series of um, thoughts from uh, um, uh, American pilgrims in, uh, uh, in Brazil. Uh, oh, this, oh, this is pretty interesting. This is the first book about cryptography. It's from the early 1800s. So to this crowd, maybe, maybe pretty interesting. Um, but I, I know what you really want. I think this explains itself. Uh, available right now. I know what you'll be reading tonight. Uh, or maybe, what about this? This is a, a 1943 uh, book from the US Army on how to get tough. Um, and inside, there are like um, a bunch of like re really good advices if you, um, if you want to have a fun night out at the bar. Anyway, oh, OK, this is actually pretty awesome. Um, as I was preparing this presentation, I was going through um, a bunch of items in the archive, and I was, I was with a very good friend of mine, um, and he's Thai, and I just pulled up some of the, some of the Thai content that we have, because I remember we had a scanning center in Thailand. Um, so these are funerary books from, um, from Thailand. So in, uh, um, the, the tradition is that when somebody gets, gets cremated, um, it, it's the day that their, it's the last day that their body exists in its, uh, um, you know, known form. And uh, it is tradition that for uh, each person that gets cremated, the family or the friends, they get together and they make a little book uh, that kind of contains a bunch of scriptures from, uh, um, from texts, and it contains um, just a, like pictures and like a memory of somebody's life. And this is how they are remembered. And um, I mean, if that wasn't amazing enough in itself, my friend found one of his ancestors in there and like learned stuff as I was preparing for this presentation. Libraries in action. You never know what, is, what matters to whom, but uh, sure enough, this mattered a whole deal to him. Uh, this was the, the text in question. Um, or what about this? These are, um, these are books that were sent to us at the archive from, uh, from a library in, in Hong Kong. These are uh, political dissent 
uh, pamphlets things that you know somebody has a vested interest to to make sure disappear because they, um, they they matter. Um, and you know we talked about like the palm the palm leaves. Um, the Internet Archive actually started a palm leaves wiki where not only you find the pictures that we have digitized, they also get transcribed, um, and they can be referenced and linked if you're a researcher. Uh, palmleaf.org is where you can find it. It's pretty cool. Um, and you know, uh, a lot of these palm trees, uh, palm leaves, they come from Bali. Uh, Bali is pretty rock and roll. They, as a country, decided to go full digital. And so the, the, the Balinese digital library uh, is, is much bigger than just palm leaves. There are like all sorts of artifacts in here. Um, a library, a digital library also means that you, you know, um, not only can travel the world, but like learn more about your neighborhood. This is uh, the Noi Valley Voice. It's a, uh, it's a local newspaper from, uh, uh, from where I live. And we have um, all of the editions dating back to, I think, the mid-70s. Um, so, you know, okay, I've, I've shown you a bunch of like cool uh, little things. Uh, and I, I want to talk about for a second, uh, you know, what is a library? We know it's, a it's organized and it's a collection of all these cool things. There is one thing that I left out that is, I think, very important I want to stress. Who knows what this is? Any takers? Mark knows what this is. This is the Boston Public Library. Uh, this was created by Andrew Carnegie, certainly not a communist. Um, full expression of uh, American capitalism. You know what it says on the front? I took this picture about a month ago. It says free to all. Free to all. The fact that the library is free is fundamental to the way it operates. Free is a feature. It may be even the killer feature. Um, so I want to talk about why free is important. And it, it's, in a way, it's part of what makes the library. Because um, there are, OK, so first of all, there is a matter of equality. Uh, knowledge is not equally distributed. And sometimes, you know, this, this inequality um, distrib uh, falls on, uh, on, on social fault lines. Um, but be that as it may, um, the, the role of a library is to act as an equalizer. And it cannot do that if if it's pay for play, it just simply cannot. Um, a library is also important, um, it, uh, it's important that it is free because it means that it doesn't depend on the, the money of pa patrons to, to exist. And it needs to exist because um, knowledge is easily lost. You remember what happened in Alexandria. I mean, we weren't there, but we know. Uh, and you know, a library needs to celebrate the diversity of, 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 of humankind. Um, and you cannot be tethered to, uh, to a business model and do that. Like, the incentives, they simply don't align. Um, and ultimately, and I think in this day and age, it is particularly painfully obvious that we need this, but a library is a repository of trust. And, you know, having texts that we can trust Having texts, the, the, um, having original sources, uh, that's really, really important. And so every, li every library, every free public library uh, fulfills um, all, of these, um, all of these things. But digital libraries fulfill even more. And so we can finally get to talk about why digital libraries matter, digital. Um, and, and I want to propose a few, but there's five of them, five reasons why. The first one is that this is a Brewsterism, um, that the availability drives preservation, which means fundamentally, if nobody uses it, it will be lost. And I'm gonna break news to you guys, people are on the internet. So if, if we are to have a library, it better be on the internet, because that's where people look for things. And if you cannot find something, functionally, it's the same as if it didn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, it will be lost. And in this sense, availability is a forcing function for preservation. Um, although preservation is maybe the more important of the two functions, um, but I don't want to dwell on that. Um, and so 
digital libraries, by virtue of existing, have the ability to perpetuate uh, these digital artifacts that are all so important. Um, I'm, I put together a little, um, a little diagram here. Uh, it turns out that physical and digital uh, um, artifacts have like specular properties on, uh, on, on, many, um, on many dimensions. Some, you know, uh, I will break no ground saying that, sorry, uh, a digital book is very easy to copy, whereas a uh, physical book is very hard to censor. Um, physical books require almost no energy. They rarely run out of battery. Um, so, you know, you could engage in a, in a debate about, oh, which one is better? Well, that's not the point. The point is that these are two of the same thing. They're two sides of, the, of a new coin. You will, if you... Um, if you forgive my bellic metaphor, I think that we, with e-books, we are in a little bit of the same place where we were when airplanes were first invented um, and used in war. So at the beginning, you know, airplanes were used in, for reconnaissance and mostly for, uh, for fighting the same war with a new tool. Uh, but over time, what really became evident is that airplanes are an entirely new dimension. And I, I think with books, we are in a similar um, situation where this new digital artifact and this mm, digital libraries that we're building, uh, they really can offer features that were inaccessible before, e even inconceivable. Think about accessibility. That doesn't just mean you know, scaling fonts up and down, and that's also very important. It means, it means also read aloud. Uh, it means like the ability for, uh, for, for people who are impaired in various ways to access materials. Um, and it also means the ability to access these items when you cannot physically go to the library. And a lot of you in here are able-bodied, but all of you in here lived through COVID, and at some point we we couldn't go to the library, and this suddenly became really, really important accessibility. Um, and since we're not tethered to the atoms, you know, uh, digital libraries can, can can really help there. Um, searching and indexing—that's another fantastic feature. Like at the Internet Archive, uh, my friend Giovanni implemented a full text search engine and right now for free. Right this second, you can go to archive.org and in the homepage, it lets you search uh, the full text of 40, 50, however many million texts. There is like patents and papers and books and what have you. You can search all of that instantly for free right now. This was, to me, this is mind boggling still because I use this thing almost every day and whenever it works, I'm like, what? It's, I mean, I also like know like how much goes into making this system, but uh, the fact that we can realistically have it and we can have it for free, that's just amazing. Um, oh, and then there is sharing. And I want to talk about sharing because sharing is not just like your little button, right? And the button matters, like sending stuff to your friends, that's really important. Um, but there is something to be, to be said about sharing in the economics of scale, right? It's one of the properties of digital artifacts is that they are very light. Like right? once you created it, uh, there is almost no cost in carrying it around. And um, under the right um, predications, let's say, um, it, it is entirely conceivable that after the, um, the digital artifact has been created, um, it can facilitate things like interlibrary loans, like you no longer have to send the actual book. Uh, you can, um, there, are, there is this service, I don't recall the name, but uh, you can ask a library to send you like a, a chunk of a book. Um, that can also be sped up. Uh, you, you, can, uh, you can really supercharge the sharing infrastructure of, uh, of libraries with, uh, by building a digital library. Um, there's obviously multimedia, um, like embedding, like the ability of really experiencing texts and, uh, uh, and learning in a way that we haven't before. I, for instance, for one, um, I really struggle. I really like maths, but I'm not good at it. Um, and I really struggle learning it from books, but if I can like see stuff that moves, uh, that really helps me. So uh, that's a classic example of that. Um, and then, uh, and then the, there's linking. I think this is another, like, killer feature uh, that, that I think if you have spent any amount of time doing research on, uh, on Wikipedia, um, th this will speak to you. So this page is for Martin Luther King. And at the end, 
down here you have a quotation for Cutler S, Abuse of Power. Well, um, at the archive we went and fixed two million of these links, and now they deep link right into the page where the citation is, is, is for. You can have access to all of this wealth of information at a click. That's what a digital library can do. That's why it matters, because um, it, it really expands your, your ability to, um, to be creative, to, and, and to do research, and to learn. Um, and then, ultimately, uh, the reason why a, a digital library matters is that um, in, in this world uh, that we came to live in, we are making very heavy use of digital assets, but somehow we don't really have the infrastructure for it. And so, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about fake news, but that seems to be a problem. Um, first source, like original sources um, that are trustworthy are hard to come by. Libraries are not just places. Libraries are organizations. They are people and they are reservoirs of trust. Having a lender of last resort that you can trust that will have the right untampered original file may really matter. Um, and also, you know, um, lots of copies keep things safe, but what happens if nobody has the copy? We have to have a lender of last resort, somebody uh, who has the torrent file, the, the, the file that all the torrents resolve to. Um, anyway, I want to just wrap this up. Um, I, I hope I, um, I made a case for why building digital libraries matter, but um, I, I want to make it further in, in, in the sense of like how, how does this like affect your life right now? Well, um, here's a couple of ideas. Reading, like knowing that this resource exists, I'm not talking about the Internet Archive, but there is tons of other digital libraries, and I encourage you to discover them and even build them. Uh, but if you don't take even an active role in uh, um, in building one, you can certainly be a patron and, and consume it. So uh, be reminded and be uh, uh, aware of the fact that there is like this joyous resource that, that you can use and you can just like um, delve into. Um, and you know, at least on the archive, you can upload your digital files, but you're already doing that on your Apple Cloud or whatever. Just like be mindful that um, what you really are doing is constructing a digital library. Um, weaving books into Wikipedia. Uh, very important. Uh, w if you find a broken link, you can uh, you can fix it yourself or, or tell us. Oh, and you have books that you think should make it. If you have a book that you have seen nowhere and you want it to be on the archive, send it to us. Um, Archive.org. You will find the address on there. We take physical donations. Send it to us. Um, you know, uh, after this experience of COVID, we are all homeschoolers, right? We all had the experience of being like stuck at home and just have like, no access to, to the outside world. That's a reminder of like, how this library may be useful to you. All of the stuff at your fingertips, it's not just a caprice, it really matters. Think, think of students who couldn't complete their classes. Um, and you know, you could travel the world, access all of these libraries ar around the world. There is libraries everywhere, and everybody is building digital libraries. It's not, I'm not just like, this is not a spot for the archive. This is really, um, a, a love letter to, to digital libraries. Um, and I, I think, I, I just want to conclude by saying this. I think um, from the dawn of time, uh, you know, people have built libraries, like they, they are a fundamental part of, uh, uh, sorry, knowledge accumulation is a fundamental part of like how a, a society functions. And if we are to have a functional society, we have to have functional libraries. And if we have, if we want to have a functional internet, we have to have functional digital libraries. The dream of the internet was to have like this open library, this open conversation, and this free exchange of knowledge. Boy, has it turned out to be harder than we thought, but it, it was the right idea, and it still is. Thank you. I think we got a couple of minutes. Yes, um, so we have questions. If you have questions, there's a microphone here. I, I have swear to God, if you ask me about OCR. No, no. Um, what was your biggest achievement and toughest challenge in your journey? Wow, that's a good one. That's like an interview question. In five uh, years, where will you see yourself now? <laughs> Okay, the, not to pat myself on the back, but 
I think my biggest achievement, nobody cares about this, thankfully, uh, but I rewrote that whole app that you saw. Uh, when I picked it up, it was kind of a mess. Uh, and then, you know, I, I made it an even bigger mess, uh, and then it went into production. And so I had to refactor the whole thing, and I managed to do it. I, I could talk about for hours about like what that entailed, but um, it was like, there is this famous metaphor of changing the wheels where you're going 100 miles an hour down the highway. It was exactly that, except the car was on fire. Um, uh, that was my biggest, what, what was the hardest thing? Oh, definitely the corrections. Definitely like that, that rigmarole of sending back stuff to the original station and like track where the book is, that was a nightmare. That was a nightmare. Uh, the other online question we have is, um, and this kind of goes to like libraries can have books that are still in print or still being published. Sure. But how does uh, this uh, uh, digitalization affect copyrights for books still being published? How does it affect copyright? Copyright. So that way. Oh, you know, that is a much uh, that is much bigger conversation. I'm really not qualified to talk about. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I have a question for, well, I have a question rather. Um, if hypo hypothetically I have a partner who looks at me wrong whenever I bring a new book in the house, um, how can I do this at home so I can keep all my books? How you can digitize stuff at home? Y yes. Oh, that's, re that's a really tough one. Uh, I guess it's a function of how much time you have and how much effort you want to put into it. Um, There is a great little project. It's called the DIY Book Scanner. Um, it's something that uh, we actually drew from in designing our own um, our own scanner. It's a, it's an open source hardware project that um, uh, will help you build a little rig. It's made of like wood. It's very simple to build. Um, it's like it creates a, a, a cradle uh, with plexiglass and uh, there is some wood and you can like, uh, with two cameras, like very cheap cameras, you can actually build a pretty functional books digitization uh, system. As far as software is concerned, um, there is a ton of open source software to do, um, to do book scanning. But if you want to know more about that, I can talk to you at length about, uh, about software for sure. Davide, I think people here might be interested in the lawsuit. Are you gonna? Mention that? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, uh -huh. I know, I know what to say. I watched so many movies. The, oh my God, my entire life led up to this. Under the provisions afforded to me under the Fifth Amendment of this Constitution, <laughs> I respectfully decline to answer the question. Do you mind? Do you Finally, mind? all of the time watching the Enron trial is paying back. Do you mind if I mention it? Kind of. Okay. <laughs> well, let me just say. Four publishers have sued the Internet Archive for copyright infringement for lending out too many books when all the physical libraries in the world were closed and setting up the emergency lending library. Um, before that, we would lend as many books as we had out at a time as we had physical copies of. And we exceeded those limits when all the libraries were closed. So you might look at archive.org in the blog section to see the details about that. My question may have almost just been answered, but I wanted to expand on the previous copyright question by narrowing it to, I did notice the feature on the screen about like borrowing the book and I haven't, I probably should have, but haven't taken advantage of that. Can you tell me more about how that works and it, does that only apply to copyrighted work? So the rest, you can just see it without borrowing it? Oh, sure. Um, the way that works is uh, that you can, um, like only one person at a time can, can um, access the book and uh, you, you make an account on archive.org and um, you request access to the book, much, much like you would do in a normal library. You have it for an amount of time and then you return it and the next person in line gets it. It's free. Uh, is there anything that you guys like either refuse to publish or refuse to archive that you were given or submitted or? Uh, you mean? Like, we looked at it, we're like, ah, uh -huh, not this. Yeah, like it was a super obscene or something. Uh, oh, yeah, no, right. No, I think, no, not really. I mean, there is like, I mean, ISIS at some point was like really big on uploading videos on the archive, and so we tried to like put a lid on that. Yeah. But we didn't delete it. We just like, yeah. you know, like tried to dampen the amount of propaganda that would go through our channels, trying not to serve them that way. Uh, th this, actually, this is actually a uh, related question. Um, 
do, uh, to what extent do digital libraries see it as their responsibility, or to what extent do you think it's their responsibility to contextualize this sort of uh, information, like take for exam example, phrenology from your presentation? That's a really um, profound question, because Libraries are typically not just a place. They are, you know, organizations. They're made of people, and the figure of a librarian um, is is really key part of that. I don't ha I don't have an answer to that yet. I, I think there there should like the answer probably there should be some responsibility. Um, I, I, how you do that at scale, kind of kind of hard to, to answer. I know that for smaller, uh, more scoped libraries, there is like um, a lot of curation that goes on into, um, you know, contextualizing artifacts with metadata and such. Uh, it, it definitely can be done in, in, in that way at scale. Um, an open problem, I guess, but a, a very important one, a very important one. Uh, great talk, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I saw you're a fan of Borges uh, in, the, in your biography. Um, I was wondering how, uh, if you could talk about what in his work inspired you to do this and how do you think Borges would have viewed the Internet Archive? You said Borges? Yeah. Um, I actually mentioned, forgot, forgot to mention, thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, so Borges is my favorite writer uh, and he uh, famously um, called the universe a library. Um, I think that may be a little ambitious, but certainly society uh, depends on libraries. Um, there's, uh, don't, don't get me started on Borges, man. Like, we're gonna be here all night. I only have, I think, one minute, not even that. I think we're done. We're done? We're done. Woo, we did it! Thank you, guys. Thank you. Any questions for Davide? He'll be right outside the hall signing autographs, digi digital autographs. <laughs> <laughs>